Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. This week, I'm thrilled to chat with Degrassi franchise co-creator and EP, Linda Schuyler, as well as her fellow executive producer, Stephen Stone, about their groundbreaking series, the evolution across generations unlike anything else on TV, how they found their stories, and so much more. It's a wonderful interview, and I hope you enjoy. so much for making time today I, I really appreciate it i know this came together quick uh thank you mm, uh, i uh i feel like degrassi is something very special not just in the topics that it touched on i mean youtube is full of videos uh about all the times that degrassi quote unquote went there um <laughs> but but also just in the the television structure of it i can't really think of any other show that brought back cast continued on and feels like there truly is a generational uh movement forward to it so that when i watch new degrassi and don't know these kids i'm going to eventually see someone that i know or, or hear reference to someone that i do know uh can you talk a little bit about starting out with kids of degrassi street and and did you always have in mind to roll forward with the ages or or was that just a a lucky accident? Oh boy. <laughs> I mean the, the 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 whole idea of casting age appropriate Linda had right from the very very beginning. Um but in the early what we call Degrassi classic kids of Degrassi junior high and Degrassi high. I mean at the end of uh of Degrassi high as they're graduating Basically, we've run out of characters. I mean, they're, they're, they're graduating, so that that was a lesson to uh, to learn. So, when Degrassi, the next generation, that was a uh, it, it was really intentional to keep seeding younger younger characters. Something very interesting happened around season six, as as our um, you know as some of the seasons we had where you know we stayed in the same school year, so. Um, the cast weren't graduating. And um, so so what we try to do is car uh, carry on with the characters, but in university or out or carry on. And something very interesting, and these were beloved characters, but the storylines just weren't cutting through. And we started to realize how important the school itself was to the entire structure of Degrassi, that there's something about school that uh, high school in particular, that um, that creates um, structure and drama. It's almost like and one of our writers says it's sort of like prison. There's so much structure. Um, and uh, when you're beyond that, if in university you don't attend class or you're carried out of a restaurant drunk, Nobody really cares. If you're in university, it's suspected of you. You do that in university, there are consequences. Or in high school, there are consequences. Mm -hmm. So we discovered that carrying on with the characters beyond the Degrassi experience uh, just wasn't having the, the impact that we really wanted. So we started to focus more and more on the younger characters and then realized as people fell in love with the younger characters, as we were giving them more stories, that, wow, this is fantastic. This allows us to carry on and every year bring in new characters. Uh, I'll, you know, give them small stories maybe in the beginning, see who pops, see what storylines are really uh, being attractive, and then, uh, and then carry on. So you asked whether it was luck. Uh, yes, partially luck. Everything is luck in the entertainment world. It's luck and time. <laughs> totally. but, uh, but it was also just uh, hanging in there and realizing, um, you know, what was working and what wasn't. And unlike any virtually any other show uh, based on high schools, you know, in, in America, um, we don't have 30 year olds playing 15 year olds. Um, there's something. Well, you talk about how important well, it I is. I talk about um What's interesting is 
one of the the things you know and i know the word gets used a lot these days but uh, the word authentic and i think one of the reasons from the very beginning why um degrassi storytelling has felt so authentic is because we have cast age appropriate and where i see that makes a huge difference if, if we've got a 25 year old playing a 15 year old well you know, they might look the part and be believable in terms of physically, but they are going to bring with them 10 years of life experience to that role. So when you take a 15 year old playing 15, they've only got 15 years of experience. So that that shows on their faces. And that really, I think, um, and, you know, trust me, it's not necessarily easy to cast age appropriate because, you know, it, it's it's more difficult working with a lot of 15 year olds than it is 25 year olds. But I think it just gives a, a, an authenticity to the show. It gives a vulnerability and an honesty to our characters. So um, it's it's something that, that we've done right from the beginning. I think it very much changes the connection uh, that, that I have mm-hmm. as an audience member to, to feel that. And it, I, to me, it, it makes the heavier storylines even more striking to realize that, uh, I think it was an interview with uh, Adamo that I saw where, talking about going through some of the same things his character was in a, in a coming out plot line. And that's right. And, and that's you, your brain knows that, that, that this isn't as much as I loved Luke Perry, this is not a 25 year old playing a high school kid. This is a high school kid uh, addressing the, the things that a high school kid would be going through. Were there? And, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add one other thing. If you think about it, uh, I mean, there were some very major things which have happened to some of our most beloved cast. I think of JT dying in that random uh, knifing. Um, of course, Adam, um, you know, texting and driving. Um, Cam's suicide. In most shows, you you might bring in some other character who comes in for a few weeks and then has an abortion or dies or whatever. But in our case, well, that that wouldn't have been authentic. It's the main character, the loved character who, um, who has this happen. And that's tremendously impactful. And, uh, but we're able to do it because there is that growing body of young, young actors coming up, young cast coming up underneath. So just another way of looking at it. Uh, that leads exactly into what, my next question. Uh, the the storylines can often be so powerful. I've always wondered which is the, the chicken or the egg. Do you, do you know of a, something that you want to address uh, and begin writing a character in order to facilitate that? Uh, with with the long game of of work that you've got to do to build that, or or are these natural uh, storylines that just come out of like you said this pressure cooker of high school and this time in people's lives, you know, there's just going to be natural drama. Uh, is it is it I, a split? I I would say it's very much a split. Um, there are sometimes, particularly when you're kicking off a season, you might know that we want to really delve into a particular topic and, um, you know, you do that and then you, you cast accordingly. But, but I think one of the first times I became very aware of this was back in the classic show, which is what we call Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. We knew we wanted to tell a teen pregnancy story. And in those days, there were what we called after school specials where you might have an after school special with with a pregnant teen and then it the story would wrap up and that would be over and i really wanted to tell a story about a pregnant teenager who kept her baby and we would follow that storyline through 5 years of um high school junior high and high and we didn't know when we wrote the series who would be our pregnant teenager and I remember one, one day having lunch with my writer, a, a couple of us, and we were all sort of arguing the merits of this person and that person. And Spike, who eventually became our pregnant teenager, she we didn't even have a character written for her. She had come to an audition with that crazy spiked hair of hers. And we loved her, but we didn't have a character for her. So we just randomly called her Spike and she was in the show. And when we got to about season six or seven, we were really enjoying um, her presence. And we were debating Stephanie Kay, Caitlin, um, and Spike. And we decided, you know, we think Spike's ready for it. We don't know a lot about her character. We have confidence in this young performer that she can play the role. And we 
so she got the role in that regard. And uh, it was so funny because when we would, when we would do um, high school tours and mall tours, people would sometimes she would get like people saying to her, it's really awful that, you know, you, you, you had a baby so young <laughs> and, and she would go, guys, I'm the actor here. I'm so young. I haven't even had sex yet. <laughs> Well, and um, and the office was inundated with gifts that came in. So people used to mail things back in those days, and they were mailing teddy bears and all the. You got all the man. shower gifts. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I uh, I have heard y'all talk about the difference in uh, Gen Z millennials and, and doing the new versions and speaking to a new generation. And I, I'm in my early 40s and I'm just starting to feel that get off my lawn. You kids these days are different. I, and, and, I, and I know that, that some of that is, is just false, that, that kids are kids and, and growing up is growing up universally. But, but I do think about the difference in uh, screens and technology and social media and, and whatnot. From, from your side of it, uh, telling stories about these ages, has it really changed? Have there been new things that you just simply never had to address in, in the, the kind of original? But I think there's two answers to that. And one thing you've always said, Linda, is on the one hand, it's, like it's, it's the same. When you're a teenager, you are a misfit. I mean, you've got one foot in adulthood and one foot in childhood. Um, and, and there's drama. Uh, there's drama in that. Mm-hmm. But there's no question. Uh, not only has life changed, but the, uh, our storytelling has to have changed. Uh, things are much more fast paced uh, these days. We we would be privy to a lot of research about um, you know uh, about the, the classes that we were portraying, and it really does seem that the Generation Z that uh, that is here now, you might think they've grown up with screens. They've grown up knowing that the world is a really, really dangerous place. I mean, now it's COVID, but before it was the Twin Towers. And they, they've lived in a, in a world of terror. And you might think that these kids would be, um, well, you know, let's live for today because uh, tomorrow we may not be here. So let's just party. And mm-hmm. no, these kids really want to save the world. They, they know that we've messed up the world and somebody has to save it. And that somebody is them. They are very, very, um, you know, conscious about climate change, about what's going on around the world, about uh, equal justice for, for all human beings. It's quite amazing. So I think in that sense, um, kids have changed in some of their views, but they're, but they're still kids. <laughs> And I, but I think you know, like you, you, you're talking about screens and whatnot. The um, there's no question that technology has so impacted their lives, and that was one of the big things when we launched Degrassi Next Generation. Um, when we were doing the classic show, the only privacy a kid could get would be to take the long receiver off the phone with the curly cord and stretch it and take it behind their bedroom door, hoping their parents wouldn't be listening. Um, then when we started with the next generation here, Emma had a computer in mm-hmm. her bedroom and she was engaging with a cyber stalker, which was, uh, a, who she thought was a benevolent, wonderful young man, which was the storyline that you couldn't have believed in the earlier generation, but how the story got solved, how she dealt with her peer group, how they supported one another. Um, that is kind of the, 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 the glue that is universal to all uh, across all our generations. But, you know, when we moved into sort of season 10 and my writers would come to me and they would say, Oh, Linda, you know, we got to do a story about junk pics and boob shots and and whatnot. And I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) And it's just the whole protocols and how people were dating and ghosting one another and catfishing stuff we never even heard about before. It was really critical that we had our finger on the pulse of that because that's how kids were talking. And yet at the same time, you know, as Stephen said, we were very mindful that regardless of what the technology is, regardless of the bravado, that there is still a young adult trying to emerge out of a very young body and changes, hormonal changes, physical changes are happening. And that's the stuff 
that is continuity through all the generations. Well, and the other continuity in the show itself is the ethos of the show. And this can, is absolutely comes from uh, Linda and has from the very beginning. There's sort of two, uh, there, there may be more, but two central themes that I think of. One is you are not alone. Uh, and the other is um, you do have, you do have power. You, you have the power to make choice. Mm-hmm. And, and, and youth is empowered, but every choice has a consequence. And, and we try not to be moralistic about this is the right consequences or this is the wrong, but it has a consequence. And so in, essentially that is uh, being, being moral in some ways because the, the story plays out the way it plays out. That theme has run through right from the very first Kids of Degrassi Street. Mm-hmm. Right, right through to episode 525. I think that's why the show works so well. When, when someone takes an action, you watch the consequences fall out through the entire cast of characters. And, and the stories that you get from it are, are, I mean, it's like life. It's just an endless story. Thank you so much for talking to me about it all today. I, I really appreciate it. I, 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 all of my friends uh, who live in Canada, you could say to Grassy and just watch them like... <laughs> and, uh, right. I don't think I had anything quite like it uh, in the States other other than it. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, Les. Yes. TV Dudes is an independently run podcast out of Austin, Texas. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is done by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com. I'm Randy Lander. I'm Les Weiler. And I'm Kyle Scott. Thanks for listening.